Welcome back to Hendo's Hot Topics, the podcast to distract your mind. Real people and their stories, raw and uncut. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Hendo's Hot Topics. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having an amazing day and of course I hope you're loving yourself. Now we have an old face joining us today, Mr. Will Fleming. How's it going, mate? Last good, time we met. How are you? Good, good, mate. Last time we met, you were going under Please Blow My Mind podcast. Yep. And you're in a different journey now. We'll get to that. Yep. First, I want to ask you, be honest as you want to be, how is life in general? I can honestly say it's good. Love that. Yeah, I'm lucky I'm an optimistic type person, but you've got to fight for it. Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Now... I just said the last time we met, what you were under Please Blow My Mind podcast. Now, you are under a Beacon of Hope podcast. Yeah. yeah. Why the change, brother? So, Please Blow My Mind is exactly my nature. Yep. I'm a curious person. I was afforded that as a kid, to be curious, to to watch movies, to ask questions, to travel, to experience things. And I also like that I'm someone who was raised with manners. So please blow my mind as a question to people. Yeah. But I think I'm too curious in all areas. You know, I had scientists on the show. I had philosophers. I had people who had gone to jail, all types of interesting people to me. But the problem with content is we're getting pressured to be more niche. So when I reflected, I thought, what is it that I'm asking for my mind to be blown? And I think, I think... It's around that topic of hope. Mm. It's around that topic of optimism. And it's trying to see if that can be passed on or if some of us are just born with it and not. I don't know, but it's a really interesting conversation. Love that. Now, with this change, have you have you felt the need to, you know, have a change in your creativity or, you know, because you are so right with content these days. It is really niche. Mm. It's the most basic things is what people enjoy the most. Absolutely. But we both can agree that we want to give the people who tune into our platforms the highest content. So we try mm. to make it as tough as we can for ourselves to make you know, the videos look as good, to uh, make the questions articulated very nicely. Mm. So has this uh, more this more basic change in, in putting things out there, have you, have you found a bit of an effect of, mm. on your cre- creativity? I mean, dude, I think creativity goes exactly against... The algorithm but unfortunately it's under the same umbrella yep. we're all hoping our stuff goes viral but really what goes viral is the more virus side of us you know the darkness within and that's interesting mm-hmm. it is really interesting and we're attracted to that i mean have you ever wondered why so many people are into like those uh you know death type podcasts or yeah, murder yeah. stuff or you know the shades of gray stories yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's really dark there's a darkness within but what's not sexy what's not cool seems to be the opposite to that the light the the hope and so i think you know that's not going to go viral but it's it's certainly missing in our i think it's missing in our public consciousness when you turn on the news it's not news it's bad news 100 percent. and so the algorithm and I think AI and whatnot, we're all kind of sussing this out, but it's its targeting that really deep part of us, which is the monster within us. And I don't know if that's good. Yeah. You know, we that means we can be controlled, that can we can be bullied, we can be crushed. And, and I think there should be more champions for the opposite to that. And I would put you there as a champion of hope. And actually I would put most of us podcasters – as champions of hope, we're curious. The problem is that curiosity doesn't equal virality. It does, but I think I think not how the metrics are set up at the moment. Mm-hmm. With algorithm aside and, and numbers and all that ballpark, mm-hmm. are you finding it more enjoyable to do it now? Yeah, well, I've been doing podcasting for like 10 years. Yep. It started as a hobby when I was catching the, the bus to town to go to work and I don't know, I've told myself this story so many years, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think I was bored on the bus and I Googled, and this was back when data cost heaps too, you know, and I Googled what to do on the bus and podcasts came up. And the podcasts that were like really popping 10 years ago were Kevin Smith, you know, Jay and Silent Bob, Joe Rogan was obviously there, 
but nothing really locally. And I was yeah. like, I could do this. I could do this. So I started a podcast. My podcast, my first podcast 10 or plus years ago was called My Kiwi Life. And it was more of what we're doing now, just mm. these conversations. And actually that blew up really quick. And I don't know why I didn't continue that. But I thought vlogging would be the next thing because that was when Casey Neistat first came yep. on the scene. So I tried vlogging, and that's why I'm interested with you doing it every day for a year. I tried to do it every day for a year, and I ended up getting sick, you know, having, what is it, um, influenza. Yep. And so I broke my days, and I thought, ah, stuff it. But I got like 150 days into it. Um, and so I've always been doing this kind of thing, and I, and I don't know why. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I've always thought podcasting is an awesome way to meet new people, you know? There's no way me and you connect for our first podcast if we don't have a reason to connect. Yep. You know, we're of different generations, probably some similar hobbies, but most likely we won't cross paths. This thing called podcasting brought us together. And I just think, like, that's cool. That's a cool thing in life. And I wish we could have more ways to do that. And I also think I'll, I'll build on that, the idea of podcasting. I think the other cool thing about podcasting these days is it's a lot easier to find like-minded people to surround you in life, yep. which is a real positive. But also, it allows you to connect with people with different perspectives, but you're able to find the fine the fine line, the, you know, the firm ground, which these days... Like you're saying, the, the media and mm -hmm. all the news is, is really hard to find. Absolutely. So it's the bit of hope that we give to people that, yep. hey, you've got different views to me, but we're having a civil conversation yep. and we're having a good one. Bro, and hope is hope is found, and I'll try not to make this sound like T-shirt sayings. No. You know, but I think hope is found within people, within connections. Yes. I can imagine us in a different generation – sitting in some trench in a war and it sucked and it was cold and windy and we were probably sick mentally, physically, spiritually and all we had was each other and that might have come through in stories um, in jokes in sharing food but I don't know if we're getting enough of that now I'm not convinced that an internet connection is enough for us to get what we need from each other, that Wi-Fi of hope. Yeah. That that when you say it out loud, it sounds really stupid, actually. You know, that, that, nah, that's not real. You know, you just need a roof over your head. But you don't. You know, I think I'm not a really a religious person, even though I would say I'm quite spiritual, but I don't quite know what that means. But I'm sure that's what all those ancient texts were trying to articulate, you know. What is it when all the, when the chips are down, when your money's gone, when no one is going to come and save you, what will keep you going? Mm. And, you know, for me, I can't really find anything else than optimism, having some hope for the future. And, um, and if you lose that, and I mean, you know, you are someone who can talk to that, losing that hope and what it felt like and... And then how did you find it again? And, um, yeah, I think it's it's within our connections. And it's just we don't take it seriously, you know. We really don't. What's a moment in your life where you really have to test your optimism? Mm. You know, how would you say optimistic? Um, I've thought about this heaps, bro. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky person. I have a mum and dad yep. who, who loved me. You know, and they raised me with love. I'm the youngest of my brothers and sisters, so I think what that meant is I had enough people to kind of like run, run interference to too much trauma in life. You know, and I know that's not everyone's story. It is also why I'm on this journey because I feel like if you've been blessed or given space to be able to dream, you sh you have an obligation to remind people who have lost that yeah. that it's possible. You know, it's. I think sometimes we can get caught up in like, oh, no, I can't go out there and say how awesome my stuff is. Well, you should because many of us don't have that that, that love, you know, that hope, that optimism by default. 
there's too much other uh, baggage which is weighing down. So we, you know, those who can should, and we say that about a lot of things. But yeah, I had some pretty tough moments in life where I think if I didn't have a reserve of hope and optimism, a bank full, that you know, I I can imagine moments where you might get swamped. Yeah. So we had uh, my wife and I, Monica. We've been married. Well, it seems forever now, but maybe coming up t- uh, 20 years. Yep. And we got married at something like 24 or something like that. And um, we had a baby that didn't survive. And I remember thinking in that moment, wow, this is quite straightforward and simple. I either can carry on or not. Mm. And in that moment, my hope and optimism was for the other two children we had, who were small at the time. And I remember thinking, don't let this moment be their defining moment in life. You know, See if you can suck it up, carry it, take it, not forget about it, but own it, if you like, and keep going for them. And I don't know if I completely succeeded in that. You don't know how you carry your traumas. But I do know that that I that I do know that I had enough optimism and hope and support and love to do that. And so I sit here with you today and you know that was a tough moment in life but I had enough to give. And I guess what all I'm saying is like I totally get it if someone doesn't. I totally get it. But then isn't it about all of us wrapping around someone to help fill that bank of hope back up? And how do we do that if we don't even know what we're talking about, you know? And I guess that's a little bit that journey I'm on with A Beacon of Hope, but also the podcast that we've been releasing, like our new one, Let's Get Precific. So it's a made-up name. I thought it was fun on paper until I, everyone's like, what does Precific mean? Is that a word? And I said, no, it's like Google. It means nothing, but it's Precific is let's get specific about suicide prevention you know and that was how I mashed it together in my mind and and that's a podcast where I ask people like Ruben Wiki and other Pacific academics from a Pacific perspective what is optimism what is hope how do we share that and also what are the things that make people go down that path I think we know it deeply you know I think we know why somebody would feel like the world's too much mm. It must be a mixture. I mean, they call it, clinically, they call it contributing factors. I don't really know what that means apart from it must be a lot of things thrown at you. Your trauma from childhood, your current trauma, a bad day at the office, self-doubt, mm. and maybe it, maybe there's 50 of them, and then all of a sudden it weighs you down, you know? But I hope I hope the opposite is true, which is maybe a, a kind kindness from a stranger, mm. some light, some omega three, a little bit of sun, maybe connecting with the earth. It's funny, eh? When we talk contributing factors from a negative point of view, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, trauma will nail you," but no one's like. You know, taking your shoes off and walking in the forest will replenish you. We think that's the BS. And it's like, it's not. It's the basics that we've forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, your recent project, Mm. Let's Get Pacific, I resonated with this project a lot because it kind of circled around to why I started this whole podcast in the beginning. And that was to help my Pacifica mates. Mm. I was the only... I was the only white boy that they felt comfortable talking to. You know, I had a lot of Pacifica mates who couldn't speak about what they were going through at home, not even to their siblings. That's right. Not even their parents. And so I was the only I was the only person at school they could come talk to. They knew I'd been through some stuff and they knew I'd be open with them and be honest with them and listen, but listen to them, yeah. which is why I started this podcast in the very first place. So That's awesome. I'm not going to talk about Pacific anymore, yep. but I want 
you to talk about it a bit more, mate. Mm. It's a wonderful 15-part series. That's right. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, brother. Thanks, bro. I mean, you write, you raise a really crucial topic where Pacific people are proud people, so much so that there are hierarchies within that mm. system, and sometimes you're not encouraged to talk. Now, the challenge with that is it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, if you don't talk, you bottle it up. And if you bottle it up, something's going down, and it's not good. And you might have a buffer or optimism or love or support networks or access to counselling or whatnot, but if you're going to bottle it up, it'll get you. Mm. And the beautiful thing that came through on the podcast series is you only actually need one person in your corner. And what are they there for? For you to unbottle and just let out a bit of steam. You know? And it really works. And people, again, don't believe it. They think it can't be that simple. Now, as we highlighted, there's other contributing factors. You know, poverty is a huge one. I've had people talk to me over the years about, you know, stress. Mm. When you come from a Pacific family, well, let's paint a picture. You come from another country, you don't speak any word of that language. Maybe there has been no onboarding process. So, for example, you don't know you need a driver's license. You get pulled over for driving. You, so you don't understand what the police officer is saying, but now you have a financial penalty. You don't even know that you needed a driver's license. This is the story of many people in the 60s when Pacific came to New Zealand. I guess what we don't realise is that stress, and stress as we know for all of our cultures, doesn't bring out the best in us. My friend, who, who was a child of these first immigrants, said he doesn't remember seeing his mum be beaten by his dad until they came here. Mm. And so that is kind of, I guess, evidence that, look, it's not that some cultures are more aggressive and others aren't. Some cultures can have more buffers. We might call it colonialism or the remnants of that. And I don't want to kind of get into it because, you know, I'm half of two cultures, one yeah. Cook Island culture and one European New Zealand culture. But we should at least admit that <laughs> that some type of uh, having less buffers means you'll be more stressed. Being more stressed means you'll have higher blood pressure. Higher blood pressure means you'll probably have uh, more sickness, like you know diabetes. Having a you know a sickness might make you more aggressive. Like you don't have to be a doctor to work that out. And so I guess this podcast try to explore through lived experience some examples like more well-known people like Ruben Wiki talked about he was going through a rough patch in his league career and he was bottling it up because that's all he knew like concrete pill you know mm. like tough it out mate mm. and his body was breaking down on him he started fill, his body filled with boils and what I was taking away from that was your body's trying to get it out. It's doing everything it can to take what's inside out and physically to show you. And you're still going against it. And of course, that takes you down that bad pathway. And so I said, dude, what was the secret? And he said, I had to come clean to my wife. Mm. And that was the best decision I made because she was that person for me. And I was like, man... Ruben, you're telling me that the, the best suicide prevention tactic is having a partner in life? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, that's so cool because that's possible for all of us. Mm. You know, we could aim for being someone that someone might want to be around. We could aim for, you know, maybe it's not going to be the influencer that we think we think we deserve, all, you know, that whole weird online world, but maybe it's someone in our network that that we could be that their person for them 
And guess what? They'll be the person for us. And so that came through in some of the other chats. You know, we talked to counsellors um, who kind of broke down that there's these hierarchies like I was talking about. But you still have to find that one person that can be a counsellor. I mean, that's the beauty of the Mike King stuff that I think gets forgotten. He's championing you being able to talk to someone. That's it. And actually, when you explore with some of the you know, mental health stuff around the country, there's like two tactics that the government support. One is um, SSRI or a tablet. And the other is, do you know what the other is? And it's like sucks that you don't know what the other is because none of us do. But bro, it's podcasting. It's talk therapy. That's what it's called. Sharing your feelings with somebody. It's mm. just like Kiwis have a weird a weird wall up against counselling. But we could have studios like this promoting conversations. Mm. And guess what we're doing? Letting a little bit of steam out. And guess what that does? It means you don't have to carry the weight of your past, present, and future with you. And you're able to, I guess, just... Um, what would you call it? Be Unload. hopeful. Yeah. 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 And it's so true what you said about all you need is one person in your corner. All you need is one person in your corner. And I've said this many times over the years that your best friend that you've been friends with since you were a kid, you know, childhood friend, high school mate, whatever it is, you not talking and you bottling it up, you may not realize, but your best mate who's next to you five days a week, you know, every weekend, whatever it may be, may be going through the exact same thing. Yep. And all it takes is for, bro, I'm feeling shit. And he might go either, what is it, bro? I'm here for you. Talk about it. Or, me too, bro. Mm. I thought I was alone. You know, and I think I've had a lot of friends be that way to me, and I've been that way to a lot of my friends. But it makes you really realize there's still something in our minds. I, I don't know if it's just Kiwis in general, like you said, we still have a wall up against you know, therapy and, and being open. I don't know if it's key in general, but there's still something in our mind, no matter how much we know someone, no matter how much we love them, how much we trust them, mm. when we're going through shit, there's still a, a pop-up that goes, don't say anything. Yeah. Don't say anything. And I don't know what it is, but we've both spoken to Dom Harvey, mm. and you know he, he's always been very open with, he calls it, it was, his, I think it was his dirty gym bag. For years and years and years, he, he used the, uh, kind of used the, the picture that, you know, he kept on piling all these dirty gym clothes into his gym bag and left it in his car. And, it, mm. and over years, it, it stunk up, stunk up, stunk up. And it got so bad at one point, it was his, his breaking point where he just opened the bag and let all the dirty clothes out. Yeah. And it's how do we not get to that point is what we try, need to try to figure out. Yeah. And talking, like circulating it back to what you said at the start, you know, Podcasting is what we have in, have in common. Yeah. If it wasn't for podcasting, most likely wouldn't have crossed paths. Yeah, and it's a real shame that that's the case because yeah. it's awesome the people you meet. Yeah. You know, you will have the same experience of your network is massive because we have a reason to reach out to people. Yeah. And, and it brings out the best in us. You yeah. know, you're not always perfect. I'm not always perfect. But right now we're trying to be probably the, one of the most optimistic, optimistic versions of ourselves. Mm. And I think like, that's not fake. That's like, that's like you having a chance. Maybe that's the thing here is that when you've actually got a chance to hear yourself talk and you're like, actually, I made a good point there. You know, you're also reinforcing yourself that your interests are not just your internal ones. You know, we think of all horrible stuff. And I think that's the problem here, right? That's where we draw the line and we say that's me the one that i just think of the inner critic mm. this the one that thinks the you know weird stuff and but it's maybe just like a playground and that's what you're supposed to but you're supposed to i think have a go at hearing it out loud if you're able to and because we don't i think we've got a, just a really bad negative feedback loop that's also being hardcore influenced by algorithms, you know, like we said, man, they know. I don't know if you, you probably studied a little bit of that stuff around social media companies. It actually spooked me to realize that for an algorithm to work good, 
It has to make you more predictable. And it made us all predictable. It made the person on the fence who could be a bully become a bully. Mm. It made the person on the left who needed to go all the way left, left, and the same on the right. And the truth is we're all not really like that, but we've been kind of like pushed. And um, I think that sucks. I think there should be laws against that. I think we need to work harder to find common ground with people. And and when you actually make an effort to do that, you re, you actually unlock a few things, you know, like uh, in our podcast, the Let's Get Pacific, people were really vulnerable. They were like, you know, like one of the things that was a bit taboo to talk about was in some Pacific circles, mental health struggles are seen as more like... Um, I'll probably get this wrong, but the essence will be correct. You didn't, uh, you're being punished from like a higher mm. power or like possessed. Mm. And so you have these people like Dr. Sioni Vaka, who's a, a, a mental health nurse in the Tongan community. And he's saying, no, no, no. This, you have to, we're re educating our families. This is not a punishment, these are symptoms of other things going on. So kind of trying to avoid it altogether. Just kind of saying like the church stuff, doesn't matter how much you give or pray, that's not the reason you're going through mm. mental health crisis. This might be a, they're different contributing factors, but, you know, these are really taboo things to talk about. And so it was, it was difficult. But, you know, also in Pacific culture, the word for talk or conversation is broken up in two words, tala, noa. Mm. And you'll often hear Pacific talk about tala, noa, or in Māori kōrero, you know, but in tala, noa, you know, the beautiful thing about it is it's two words. So tala is the word for talk, and as it was described to me, noa is a space, mm -hmm. or another word for neutral. And so the goal of the tala, noa, or the conversation, again, man, it's like podcasting, is about parties coming together to try and have a conversation to keep things neutral. And I thought that's so beautiful. It's so different to how we say in English, oh, let's just have a yarn, you know? We need, the you know, the translation, if we were doing it from a Kiwi perspective, would be something like drink talk, yeah. where we need booze to be open, to, to calm us, to open. Yeah. The problem with booze is it amplifies other parts of our psyche, eh? And I just thought, you know, we could learn so much from each other in terms of our cultures if we implemented it and knew what we were doing, you know. That's why it's like, that's why, I, you know, and I'll, I won't say it in a mean way, but that's why I have part beef with TV and radio because they still won't have a truly authentic chat, you know. And I talked about this with Dom. But on the surface, when Dom was the radio guy for 20 years, you thought, ah, oh, that Dom, but it wasn't, you know. The one you see in the podcast arena is Dom. He won't, like, look for something to embarrass you with. He won't try and fill the dead air. And that's why I think, like, we're actually having a Talanoa now, you know. Mm. And it's kind of cool, man, because I feel justified in um, backing backing this whole thing of podcasting because I knew it was more than just just a random chat. You know, it was about connecting with people, sharing stories with people. I think those heal conversations when we have stories, they inspire thought. And, uh, you know, you try and do it every week, I try and do it every week, and uh, that's why we love it. Yeah. Because you go into it and you're like, man... What are we going to say? How am I going to start this? And then, of course, human the human spirit awakens and we start connecting and it's like, feels awesome and hopefully people enjoy it and it's like, it's a nice circle all the way around. Yeah, the, I, I want to touch on saying another beautiful thing about podcasting is it's personally it's helped me realise how disconnected we've all become. Mm. We're so we're so inflicted with 
how our Instagram feeds look like, you know, if if our Instagram profiles are aesthetic, if we're if we're listening to the new trendy music, if we're watching the new shows everyone's doing, if we're traveling every few months because our favorite influence is doing that, we're so focused on our persona mm. that we forgot about, and I'm going to reword what I was saying before, how to be our own person in our corner. Yeah. All, so worried about everyone else and what everyone perceives us as, we forget about how to be ourselves. Absolutely. How do we make ourselves happy? Mm. You know, how, I think g- great challenge for you tuning in at home now is tomorrow morning, what I want you to do, as soon as you wake up, try your hardest that your first action is not to reach over and grab your phone. Mm. Don't reach over and grab your phone and, and check how many notifications you have. If you have a Snapchat, if, if people have liked your recent photo, if there's you know if there's a new piece of clothing or your your favorite influencers posted, try and make that a challenge and challenge yourself to see just how disconnected you are from yourself. Absolutely. And I'll put my hand up and I'll say, you know, being in the, the podcast game is I find a lot of my time is on my phone trying to, you know, make reels or film my day in life or make another quote or figure out what I'm going to do for my my next episode and. For the, for the past month or so, I feel that's put a, str- not a strain, but I felt a bit of a nick into me and my partner's relationship. Absolutely. You know, she's she's studying now and she's working her ass off at work and she's not on her phone much. And then here's me on my phone, I'll probably say, it's just going to sound really bad, but probably 10, 10 hours out of a day. Mm. And it's made me realize how disconnected are we really? It's become life. It has become life. This thing is either near me in a two foot radius or it's in my pocket by my side every day yeah. and I'm always the the dopamine I get from a or mm. the email notification or something is the same dopamine I got from when I was five running around in the paddock with my granddad and it's constructed us into being a, a pretty much just a, a lifeless skeleton protecting a brain and a heart you know, for a lot of people, it's hard to find meaning these days because attention spans are so short. They're, they're seeing people younger than them driving Lamborghinis for their first car overseas and stuff. It's like, stuff that. Focus on you and how you can make yourself happy. Mm-hmm. Stop comparing and stop worrying about what your next five years or or if you if you can be like this person when they're your, they're, you're their age. Stop all that. Put your phone down, you know, don't don't have to read a book, but read a book or reground yourself outside. You know, take your shoes off, go into the mm-hmm. forest, mm-hmm. go into the lawn with you know, spread your toes out, reconnect with with the basics and and how you can feel relaxed 100%. and and distracted, distracted from the thing that distracts you. Mm. You know how can you become distracted from that? How can you live life again? These are these are powerful tools, but weapons of mass destruction when it comes to life and robbers of what could be yeah you know um one of the fears we have i think it's a bit that analogy with uh dom for example we talked about dead air which is that's the worst thing on radio like if i just go quiet for a second (laughs) you'd never hear that gap someone's got to fill it and that's the problem with these the phones and the algorithms they have to fill the gap some of the best stuff you ever will come up with is in the gap, you know. A friend of mine, Jimmy Hunt, calls it the shower thought. Mm. You just in the shower and then boom, something happens. Well, guess what? It's because you probably have stimulus from the shower or your body's like, cool, man, we're in a waterfall or something. It thinks that you can't just be in the shower, <laughs> but of course we're in this man-made construct, right? And um, we're so fearful, I think we've been trained now that there's no dead space. So guess what? We want to fill it. and There's a hundred things you could work out in your dead space if you create that space. Like One of the things I like to get people to ask themselves is, what can you do that you find easy and others find hard? And that's like quite a confronting question for some people because everyone's like, oh, what do you mean? It's like, well, what can you do that when you do it, others like, maybe they show... They admire you because it's like, how do you do that? Or maybe it's drawing, maybe it's podcasting, you know, maybe it's Googling a certain topic or maybe people would call it a hobby. 
something that you are just really good at. Maybe it's a gift. You know, what a lovely way to think in life that we could all be given a gift. And actually, I believe it to be true, you know. I'm not going to go and dunk basketballs, but I can do a thousand podcasts and others would find that horrible, but I find it fun. Yeah. So the second question is like, will people pay for it? And if the answer is yes, chase that, you know. Chances are you already have like a 10,000 hours. You heard 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell talks about successful people are people that had enough, I guess what we call privilege or buffers. As I, Buffers are an easier way for me to talk about it because it's not so culturally related. If, you have, if you're lucky enough to have a buffer, you most likely became good at something because of that buffer. Let's say your parents drove you to the doctor and for one family, they say to the child, what's one thing you want to ask the doctor? The child thinks about it, says, oh, I want to know what that mole is, for example. That's actually not just the parent preparing the child for life. It's giving the child these skill sets that they can leverage in other ways. The other child where the parent does all the talking, that child has n doesn't know how to interact with an adult. And that was the example he gave. And so he said, like, these children who get up to 10,000 hours of training then go on and master that. But there must be something that we're all doing because it's a gift or a hobby to us. And I think if you think about what that is and then you ask yourself, you know, will people pay for it? That just helps. Um, it's been a fun exercise for me to do. So, like, that's you know, podcasting or podcast producing or hanging out with people. I love it. You know, I like the prospect of trying to get someone to believe that they have something to say on a microphone like this. Mm. And most people are honestly shit scared to try it because we're not used to hearing our voice. You know, we just established before we're internalizers. But when they do it and they feel like they can do it and they hear themselves do it just like we're doing now, you get this awesome reward, way more than a phone can offer, but you also get more. You get a connection. If you if you do your job well enough as a talker, podcast host, you get a friend out of it, all these other things that kind of make sense to have a you know hopeful life. And so, you know, I guess I'm going a bit all over the place, bro, but um, yeah, I think we've just got to... Yeah, we've got to fight against that stuff that brings us down, you know. And I don't know how to. I'm someone who's lucky to have had buffers in their life. Uh, but uh, th that's my message. If you're not lucky to have had buffers, then find that one person, you know, that you can let some of the steam out. When you think enough steam's been let out, don't fill that dead air, you know. Find that thing that you have just by accident because, you know, who knows? It could be anything, knitting or press-ups or you can sit and hold your breath the longest. Then will someone pay for it? And if they, if they would, then awesome. Then you can make your career. And I think that's the best suicide prevention tactic. The friends I've talked to, they said, if we can help Pacific people and Māori people who are on average the highest in the statistics with financial literacy, that will solve a lot of the other contributing factors. Mm. Less, uh, less stress about money, less stress about that means less worry. Less worry means less high blood pressure. Less high blood pressure means less bad decisions. And you can see how that gets alleviated along the way. And um, as you're experimenting, and I am too, taking total ownership of what you do in life is I've found to be the best suicide prevention tactic because you worry about your well-being. You worry about your, where your money comes from. It might feel good to outsource that to others, but then they get all of your wins. Mm. You know, they control you, and there's a dopamine hidden control. I mean, humans have had a a long history of owning other people. You know, and it's it's somewhere deep in us. Each of us say hey, it's not 
that some people are like that. Dude, put us in these scenarios where it brings out the worst in us, i.e. a depression or COVID or an algorithm, and uh, we will be that monster. So, you know, we're, we're here fighting to be to be hopeful and optimistic. Love that, Will. Mm. It is, yeah, it's, it's that dog in everyone. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird, eh, because we love cute things too. <laughs> the cute cat. Yep. You know? So why does that go viral? <laughs> but saying that we should be nice and be kind and be a person of hope for someone else, that won't go viral. Or maybe it does, and maybe that's why I'm doing the beacon of hope is that when you have your dark day, you might find something like that and tune in, you know, and there'll be a resource there for you. Yeah, I've been trying to think more down that path at the moment. Um, another idea that I'm trying to develop is creating a podcast specifically for people who are in jail. Because I was like, man, what a liability if you get access to books. Yeah. What if you can't read? Do you get access to audiobooks? And then who is the judge of what's good for you or not? So uh, yeah, one of my dreams is to create a podcast series where I bring experts in about if you are open to transforming your life and you, you know, maybe it's a, you're given a device which is not connected to the internet, but it has the series, you know, how cool would that be? But again, like, that's not our current system. Our current system, I don't think, values the power of conversation. And um, weirdly, you got to turn to guys like us who are just random nobodies <laughs> out there podcasting. Yeah. What a liability. Yeah. You know, the un, like the, maybe I'm building it up too much, but that's a huge liability. There's so many more people qualified to fill the shoes we are. We're just dudes. We're just randoms. But that's why I think people like. Mm. You know, they they like, they like everyday Joes. You know, we we're hustling like everyone out there. Yeah. You know, we're doing what we can to survive day to day, mm. pay the bills, mm. get dinner. Mm. You know, we don't we don't work for big companies. Yeah. That's what I think. That's what people like. That they can relate to us in that sense. That's what they need. Yeah. It's just the people who are charged with doing that at the highest order aren't themselves. Yeah. And that's a statement of government all the way down, you know. You've got the best comms people to simulate being a person. You've got Simon Dello who sits on the radio, uh, TV reading a script through the cameras. But it looks like he's looking at you. Yep. But he's not. And he's got an earpiece in, and he's connected to 50 people in a studio because I've worked in that environment. It's like he's got people telling him two minutes to go, camera one. And it's not fair because to us it seems like he's got his shit together. But that's what it takes to have your shit together, 50 people in your corner, you know? And we're only saying it'd be awesome if you had one. To survive in life it only takes one. Yeah. But to thrive, it probably takes 50, just like the highest have, you know. Look at all the top-end people. They've all got teams. That's how hard, that's how brutal life is, eh? Like, it's beautiful life, but that's how brutal it is. It takes 50 people to make you awesome and to thrive. And um, I think I think they know that. And most people don't know that and so we're just out here hoping positivity is enough but doesn't match the algorithm bro we just get wiped out from it and we are hey look at the suicide stats like wiped out it just drives you to the ground yep. drives you to levels of hopelessness that uh have never been seen before in our in our world so yeah man um you know, all we can do is just be that beacon, as you have for all your episodes, telling people that it's the simple stuff that makes the difference, that there's no quick fix, but that there is a real thing when you truly connect with someone. And, you know, it's um, worth doing. 
Beautiful, mate. Before we wrap it up, I want you to paint a picture in your head, right? Your life up to this moment has been a film, okay? And just before those closing credits come, you have one more scene. It can be for your, a message to your kids in the future, a message for yourself in the future, or a message you want to put out into the world. What would that be? That's heavy. Good. I would say trust that trust yourself that you're probably not wrong you know I'd say don't really listen or follow or do what I did just trust that your gut will help you uh, and you know really really believe in that maybe more than more than you think you should I think we should probably trust our gut so maybe it's trust your gut mm. maybe it's really really trust your gut and take it seriously because I think we have gut feelings and then we override them really quickly but that that survival thing which is arguably what the whole gig is about a eh, surviving we've developed other systems which help guide you you know trust your gut move down that way talk to other people who have trust their gut you know I, I found a, um, a mentor for the first time I'm 42 I found a mentor at 40 i had been looking my whole life you know not I was looking I wasn't looking for like a OB1 or something like that but I just had real problem listening to people who I didn't think were better at better than I was where I'm at you know so like yeah. that's why it's hard for me to listen to managers because you can't tell me to do something if you're not better than me <laughs> especially about a specific skill you know that I spent years getting one good that at. you know you're good at yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's difficult right because of role of a manager is to somewhat own you but I found a mentor and one he's really rich so I was like well he did something <laughs> right and two he like believed in his system you know when he was a young guy he read a book about have you heard much about cause and effect mm -hmm. yep but he took it seriously and bottlenecks and things like that so cause and effect and bottlenecks if you're in business you're that's terminology used you know you first work out your bottlenecks and then you work out what when you have a cause what's the effect so you know i put that into my podcast business i know when i talk to somebody or when they have a conversation, they'll feel good. And I think I can monetize that. And I think that's a good service to monetize. But I found someone who took it dead serious, that stuff. And I love learning from him. You know, I absolutely love it. And so he trusted his gut and it made him a squillionaire, you know. And I don't know if that's my drive at the moment to be really rich. I don't think it is. But I think maybe you do become rich when you put all these things into order so that goes back to your thing man like I, I'm not really one for advice but I'd probably say what's helped me is trusting my gut and taking it serious mm. what a way to finish the film <laughs> thanks brother thank you for coming on today Will dude I invited myself it was awesome <laughs> I don't care well, I'm saying thank you for coming on mate awesome. it's, been, it's been an amazing chat and really nice to see you again Will. yeah you too bro all the best for all your projects to come. And, mate, let's, I'm putting it into the universe now. Universe? Yep. Do your thing with the algorithm <laughs> and get to get Will where he needs to go. Boom. That's all we hope. Thanks so much. Beautiful, mate. As always, guys, do what makes you happy. Do what you know is right and do what you need to do for you. Love yourself, be kind to others, and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.